and he hoped one day that they would accept him as one of them. But he said the, the more he understood the language, the more he approached towards the Japanese, the more they pushed him away. <laughs> there are many stories of Westerners who've married Japanese, who learned the language, who cannot become Japanese. Recently, another friend of mine was an anthropology student. She went to work. Her mother is Japanese, her father is Western. She went to work in a hotel in Tokyo, and she speaks pretty good Japanese. She looks Japanese. And she hoped that as she worked there over the months going along, they would accept her. She looked it, she spoke it. No, she was a foreigner. Never, you can never become Japanese. And this means that outsiders are dangerous and often inferior. Um, this is co totally different to my experience in China. When I come to China, Sarah and I feel very, very quickly absorbed into this place. Our Chinese friends are very loving. They make us feel at home. And likewise, when Chinese students come to Cambridge, they are very open with each other and with me. And there is no kind of a closed feeling about it at all. Um, this is a, a huge difference between these two civilizations. China is like a sponge. That is, you know what a sponge is? It's a sort of like this. It absorbs anyone who comes in. Any. I, I was amazed recently, for example, I was talking about uh, the Mongols and the Manchus. Now, these are invaders who came into China. But I was told that now many Chinese say, well, these are our ancestors. They are part of us. They are not strangers. They came, they joined. Um, so China is a sponge. Japan is like a rock. Everything must be, it's a fortress. Everything must be kept outside. Um, and so the, the Japanese are can be very, very arrogant. They think of Japan as the only civilized country. Everyone else are bar barbarians and inferior. Um, and in their model, you place civilizations on different levels. For a long time, until the early 20th century, although they thought of themselves in some ways as superior, until the Sino-Japanese War in the 19th century, they always thought of the Chinese, who were much bigger and had an ancient culture, as their older brother. When that war occurred and the Japanese defeated the Chinese, they suddenly thought, we are the older brother. China is the younger brother. And in the Japanese way of thinking, if someone is inferior, you can treat them as you like. I, it's, I, it's difficult for me to say this, but this has been said by the two greatest Japanese social philosophers who described the Japanese character. One of them was a 19th century, a great 19th century social philosopher who set up much of that in Japan. He's on the 10,000 yen note, if you look at that. It's a picture of Fukuzawa on that. Fukuzawa said that the Japanese are characterized by brutality towards those below them and servility towards those above them. It's a vertical society. And so he did a test just to show how this worked. He walked along the main road in Japan, which is the Tokaido, which goes from Tokyo to Kyoto, a very big, famous road. And he walked along. First time, he walked along as if he was a, a peasant. And he spoke with the local dialect. So he walked along humbly like this. And if he was 
speaking, he would speak in a local accent. When he met other people, they would just kick him aside. Get out of my way. You know, you scum. Go on. And uh, treated him as just like a dog. So he then walked, same clothes, everything, but he walked like a daimyo, like this, and spoke in a very upper class accent, like this. And everyone went. <laughs> he said the Japanese are like rubber, rubber dolls. They inflate themselves and then they shrink. Unless you understand this, you will not understand the Sino Japanese War. When the commander of the Japanese troops uh, in the war trials was asked, Why did you invade? Japan. Why did you behave like that? He said, because we loved them too much. We loved China. And loving China and being the older brother, when the Japanese, uh, when the Chinese didn't behave properly towards us, it was our duty as an older brother who loved the younger brother to chastise them, <laughs> to kill 20 million of them, whatever it was. Um, so we did not fight them out of hatred, we fought them out of love, as a superior to an inferior. So another enormous difference, I think I'll just go on till 22 and then finish that, okay? Another enormous difference is here, um, the stratification systems. I can deal with this probably quite simply because I've talked about it in relation to mechanical and organic solidarity. The traditional Chinese system had the ma mandarins and the emperor and the, the, the trade people up here and the rest, not forming into any particular social groups. The, um, I could show you actually here. The Japanese social system, you have the emperor and the shogun, then the daimyo and the samurai. These, this is the ruler, this is the, um, I'm not going too close, this is the, the nobility, the ruling class there. Then um, you have the peasants, and then you have the people who make things, the artisans, and the people who sell things, the merchants. So you have four groups, each with their special legal position, their special language, their special um, privileges, and so on. So Japan has a fourfold structure, but it's very different from that in uh, India and Europe, because we, Japan has no religious group, nothing equivalent to the mullahs of Islam, the Brahmins of India, the clergymen of Europe. So it has two economic orders, which reflects the greater importance of the economics in Japan, the peasants and then the nobility. It has a very large bourgeois, that is town middle class group, these two groups down here which is absent in China, traditionally. This is related to a, another great difference, that if you look at Chinese cities, historically, the great cities, you had huge cities like Shuzhou, and Hanzhou, and Chengdu, and so on. They're very peculiar from our point of view, because all they are is a, a big wall round the outside. 
And some people are inside that wall and some people are outside that wall. People inside that wall are no different from the people outside that wall. The people inside have markets and sell things and so on. There may be some troops, imperial troops inside. There may be some administrators. But the people inside have no particular status. They don't have a different name. They are not particularly more wealthy. They're not particularly more educated. They are not a city-dwelling group, a bourgeois. Bourgeois comes from burg, meaning city. So Chinese cities are not at all like Western cities or like Japanese cities. Japanese cities are much more like Western cities. The great cities of Osaka, Kyoto, Kamakura, Tokyo, Edo. Uh, the people inside are richer, better educated, much wealthier, and have a lot of self-government. They run their own society in a way that you don't find traditionally in Chinese. You can sort of understand why this should be the case, because cities, if they, in a place like China, if the emperor is trying to control this vast area of China, if cities become powerful, if they have their own <coughs> legal system, their own administration, their own um, system, then they are a threat. And this continues to this day. Xi Jinping, uh, or just before he came to power, he was threatened by the fact that Chengdu was becoming too powerful. Uh, Ch uh, no, Chengdu, Sichuan. The, well, Sichuan is a province and Chengdu and the cities were becoming too powerful. So as you know, he threw all, the, all your leaders into prison. Or well, maybe he didn't, but it previous government. The same with the mayor of Shanghai, with uh, uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Wen Jiabao. The, 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 there, there is a danger now in China that the provinces become too powerful, the cities become too powerful, and it threatens the center. So there's always been this danger in China. But in Japan, with its feudal system, um, they managed to avoid this. Another way they managed to avoid this was a very clever device, which was that the feudal leaders, the military leaders in this feudal system, they were very powerful, but they would spend two years in charge of their large counties. Then they would go and have to live for two years in the city with the emperor or the shogun. When they were living in their own county, they would have to send their family to live with the shogun. So if they caused any trouble, all their family would be killed. So the time they were away, their family was there. And then they would go and have to live there. And if they caused any trouble, then so the Japanese managed to control in that way. The Chinese did it by not giving any power to cities at all. So as a final point, the attitude to, of the Japanese towards money and wealth was that this was fine. There have been a, a, a country where you have had people becoming very rich setting up big businesses. The famous businesses of China, of Japan now, Mitsu, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, all these go back three, four hundred years. They were founded in the 17th, 18th century. A family would gradually build up and become richer and richer, and you get these huge Japanese conglomerates, Daiwatsu. But in China, if anyone traditionally began to get too wealthy, they would be cut down. Chinese novels are filled with this. Anyone who becomes conspicuously wealthy is a threat. So you destroy them. 
So China hasn't got this tradition of large business corporations in the same way as Japan. And finally, the educational systems are totally different. And I did touch on this this morning. In China, education is the ladder, the only ladder to, to success. In Japan, it's just one. A better ladder is money. If you can make a lot of money, you can get power and you can become powerful. China, you could not do that. The only way was through education. And the nature of the educational system, as I mentioned, is very different. There's one more section, but it's very complicated, so I'm going to leave it. You're all exhausted, and so am I. So uh, it's about something which is really fundamental, and I perhaps I'll start freshly tomorrow with that and finish it off, because I will need to be fresh to understand it. So I'll end on the last point, which is why is it so different? Um, so The attitudes to wealth and success are different. Different educational systems. This I will leave a different degree of axiality, which I will explain to you tomorrow. Why is Japan particularly difficult to understand for a Chinese? Why did, did you, before this lecture, hardly understand anything about Japan? And the reason is that it's not just a matter that Japan is famously a mirror. I wrote a book called Japan Through the Looking Glass. The looking Glass is a mirror. Japan is a country which reflects. So whoever looks into the mirror sees themselves. You don't see the Japanese, you just see yourself. So if you look into the Japanese mirror, you see Chinese. If I look into the Japanese mirror, I see English. This is a very cunning device to stop anyone getting inside Japan and understanding it. It's also very dif difficult to understand because it is completely contradictory. Everything you say about Japan, you can say the opposite about it. It's not, um, it's a both and society. It's both this and that. One of the most famous books about Japan was written by an American anthropologist during the Second World War, Ruth Benedict, and she wrote mm -hmm. a book which she called The Chrysanthemum. The Chrysanthemum is a famous flower in the symbol of Japan. And the sword. And the sword. Now, what could be more contradictory? A flower, peace, love, beauty, and a sword. And both things are true of Japan. Japan is the most artistic, aesthetically advanced, beautiful, in its art, its culture, cities, it's the most beautiful. You have to ask what is the center of Japan. It is beauty. Everyone is aiming for beauty. This population is very highly educated in the appreciation of beauty. So it is the most beautiful civilization the world has ever known. The craftsmen are better than any other craftsman. On the other hand, it is also a brutal, aggressive, bullying civilization, which did untold damage to your civilization and also behaved very badly towards many other peoples. Both are true of Japan. You can admire much of them. They're lovely people, great artists, great writers, great novelists, but also savages. Both is true, and that's one of the difficulties of understanding Japan. It's both, as I showed with loneliness and togetherness, they're both very, very, very tied together and yet very lonely. So it's, it's almost impossible to generalize about Japan. That's another difficulty. Um, and the particular difficulty for you as Chinese to understand is that if you look at the surface of Japan, you see so many bits of China there. The, what the Japanese have done is to take bits of your culture 
your tea ceremony or uh, your art or your porcelain or whatever it is and sew them onto their costume. So when you look at a Japanese, uh, Japanese you see, you appear to see a culture which, whose costume is made of bits from China, which it is, Confucianism and so on, but in each case they turned it and changed it. So while it looks Chinese, it is no longer Chinese. Um, why it's important for you to understand this and why I've spent, spent my time this afternoon telling you about this is that hardly any Chinese understand any of this. Most Chinese do not understand Japan at all, just as very few Japanese understand China at all. Yet here you are, living next door to each other, disputing about islands, building up weapons, and in such a situation, without any understanding or mutual language to uh, talk to each other, it is very easy to have a big misunderstanding. So the purpose of these talks is to explain you to the Japanese, the Japanese to you, and then tomorrow, the same thing to Europe, and then in the afternoon to America and my country. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, the, when you uh, haven't uh, mentioned that you are uh, a book about uh, uh, Japanese culture, uh, translated in uh, Chinese, <laughs> Yes, I, I did mention that when I, I wrote a book called Japan Through the Looking Glass. Now, Looking Glass is a mirror, mm -hmm. and that's been translated into Chinese. So if you want to read my full account of how I think Japan works, you can read it in either English or in Chinese. Japan through the looking glass. It took me 15 years to understand a little of the surface of Japan. No one understands Japanese. One of the very curious things is that when I went to Japan and I said, um, try to understand it, I would say, is your culture like this? I read about it. They'd say, oh no, completely wrong. So I'd say, well, how am I wrong? They'd say, I don't know how you're wrong. <laughs> and I said, what is it? And they said, I don't know. All I know is that you're wrong. <laughs> so they don't understand themselves at all. But they know that I don't understand them. <laughs> and this is totally different from China. Again, one of the reasons why I find it so much easier to understand your civilization is that I can hold a, a, a rational, reasonable conversation with you. And when I ask a question like, you know, do you have purity or impurity, you can say yes, among the Yi people, they have this distinction but generally in the hand they don't. You know, we can have this kind of easy conversation and you can put me right if I get it wrong because you know enough about your culture to understand it. I couldn't do this sort of thing in Japan because they are completely confused about their own culture. And that's because it is a completely confusing culture. But the last thing I'll, I'll say is that both China and Japan are absolutely fascinating. Japan, as I understood it and as I wrote in my book, is amazing. It's, it's an ancient, and this is where I didn't get into the last section, so I'll talk about it tomorrow. It's an ancient civilization which has no relation at all to any other civilization on this planet. It is completely separate and different, and I'll talk about it, that tomorrow. So you have to go back thousands of years into Mongolia, Siberia, and so on to understand Japan. China is equally fascinating because I increasingly realize that what you have preserved here should be made a UNESCO 
uh, intangible <laughs> cultural <laughs> heritage. <laughs> the whole of China should be made an intangible, uh, intangible cultural heritage site because you have preserved, you are living fossils. You are preserving a way of life on this planet which goes back three, four thousand years before Confucius. And it has been wiped out everywhere else. But here, so you are a magical land. You are like um, the kind of land that is described in children's stories. When I enter China, I come through a tunnel, like in the Miyazaki, the great Japanese filmmakers, films like Spirited Away. You go through a tunnel and you come into a magical land. The same with our children's stories, like Harry Potter. Um, you go through a wall and then you go into Hogwarts, which is a magical land, or Alice in Wonderland, or whatever. You may think you are just ordinary Chinese and this is natural world, but what you preserve here is something distinctly precious and different from anything else in the world, which has been preserved alone here on this because of your, because of what I was talking this morning about the way you manage to keep things alive. So even your language, the, the uh, Mandarin written language, is a miracle. How could such a primitive, difficult language to learn continue to this day? Crazy. You should be writing English. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.